Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first conversation in a series called Ideas That Transform. Hi, I'm Nate Wong. I lead the Beck Center for Social Impact and Innovation here at Georgetown University, where we are on a mission to rebuild trust in public and private institutions for public good. Uh, the Beck Center is home to a number of action-oriented research projects examining how finance and technology can improve systems, particularly for people who are overlooked and left behind. Um, we are so excited that you are joining us today for what promises to be a very important and engaging conversation. Um, so whether you're tuning in from your lunch break or juggling childcare duties, we hope you'll find the next hour interactive, conversational, and hopefully actionable. Um, we're all experiencing disruption right now, and a lot at, and during times like this, we know innovation can be birthed. That's why we're proud to launch our first discussion in the Ideas That Transform series that explores interesting ideas that have the ability to revolutionize how we operate for common good. So tune in every Tuesday at 12 p.m. Eastern, just like today, for a new idea or event. So let's dive into our session today and explore how a government-funded institution focused on development of local economies and small business can play a significant role in our recovery. So I'll turn to my esteemed panelists. We are joined today by Agnes Dashowitz, who leads Capital Access Lab at Kauffman Foundation and is focused on increasing capital investment to underserved entrepreneurs. We are also joined by Dale Mathias, uh, who joins um, us with a 25 year career in finance and private investments in both the US and Sub-Saharan Africa. She was also Associate Dean at Columbia Business School. Agnes and Dale uh, played instrumental roles in designing and championing the creation of the US International Development Finance Corporation. We are also joined by Melissa Bradley, a tri-sector leader with more than 20 years of entrepreneurship, investment, and leadership experience. She's co-founder of Venture Backed Eureka and founder and managing partner of 1863 Ventures. So I have a round of questions to kick us off, but we do want our audience to participate. So remember to engage with us using the hashtag Beck Ideas and feel free to put your questions in the Q&A and we will try to answer them in real time. So with that, I'd love to jump into the conversation. So Agnes and Dale, I am an origin story person. I'd love to hear um, from you all around how you even conceived of the idea of a US development uh, bank or corporation and what is the real problem that we're solving? I know you've had some history together, so please tell us more. Thank you, Nate, and thank you so much for hosting us. We really appreciate uh, the role the Beck Center is taking in really trying to bring to light a lot of transformative ideas uh, that are solutions to some of the most intractable problems today. So absolutely love the fact that this is the inaugural session and that we get to participate. Um, Dale and I have been working together for a decade uh, where we basically first collaborated uh, when I was at USAID and where we uh, she was uh, the head of the chair of a board of an informal advisory board uh, of private investors who my office was working with to really try to catalyze investment to difficult countries and difficult areas where USAID was working. And after I left USAID, I started a fellowship at the Rockefeller Foundation where the idea was how do we apply a lot of those lessons learned to catalyze from international markets to catalyze capital to US neighborhoods, especially underserved neighborhoods. And uh, out of that, Dale was also my advisor during that time uh, because I also formed an advisory board of people who were actually doing the investing. And we came up with this idea that there should be a US agency, a development bank, that was really focused on catalyzing private capital to underserved neighborhoods in the US. Very similar to 
right now what the Development Finance Corporation in the U.S. does, which uh, Dale and I were also uh, behind the idea of the U.S. needs a Development Finance Corporation, and that was established with the BUILD Act. Uh, so coming out of that, we looked at each other and said, why don't we have a similar institution in the U.S.? And that, of course, became much more urgent as COVID-19 started closing down a lot of U.S. businesses, especially small businesses. So we really looked at international experience and how the U.S. government has been very effective in catalyzing investment overseas in emerging countries and really translated that to an idea that the U.S. government should be having a similar role, playing a similar role in the U.S. because the underserved neighborhoods really, really needed assistance uh, that was flexible. So that's really, that's really where the idea was conceived and it really took a life of its own uh, with the COVID crisis. Dale, I don't know if you want to add to that. I think you've covered it really well. Okay. This is great. Um, I'd love to pick on a few different angles here. So obviously you're taking um, an idea that was applied to the international development sphere, porting it over to a US context. I'm curious if you could talk about what things truly are portable and what things are uniquely um, different in the US context and how should we think about some of that rollout? So I think you know the portability of it is really the tools. And we could talk about those separately, but I do think that um, there are similarities and there are unique uh, circumstances in the U.S. So I would say the similarities are that small businesses really form the bulk of the U.S. economy. 99% of all businesses in the U.S. are registered as small businesses, which hold less than 500 employees. They provide over 40% of the U.S. economic output and they employ the majority of people in the US. So 60 million jobs is really small business jobs. So that is very similar to what happens in emerging countries where you also have a lot of small and medium sized businesses that are really the bulk of the economic uh, activity in those countries. So the US is not different when it comes to that. But what's different about the US is that there is tremendous inequality between um, really the various types of entrepreneurs that uh, are trying to innovate and start businesses and create jobs in the US. And this is where we have a lot of disparity between access to capital for women, for people of color, uh, that really needs to be uniquely addressed in the US, uh, where maybe it's not as prevalent in some of the other countries. But frankly, this is really where we are focusing on. We're focusing on how does a development corporation support small businesses in the US with access to capital and other assistance, uh, such as technical assistance and training, but also how do we make sure that that corporation is an equitable uh, agency? So it actually provides that assistance on a very equitable basis and not only equitable, it actually stresses the importance of providing capital to minorities and women, to minority and women entrepreneurs. Um, I think Dale, you might want to add because I think this is a this is a point that we're really trying to emphasize. Yeah. So what we've sort of noticed in Africa, where we both have worked for a long time, uh, is that just like, and, and unfortunately, the U.S. is very similar capital markets aren't really developed enough to finance small businesses, period. So it's, we're not just talking about diverse communities. So if you don't have capital markets that aren't developed enough to finance small businesses, then of course the diverse communities are gonna get even, are gonna be even worse off with regard to accessing capital. So we, we're, this is a very familiar picture. Uh, and the way that we really, the way that the world has chosen to deal with this kind of thing is through the tools that Agnes has talked about, specifically that the U.S. government decided to adopt through the, the International Finance Corpor Development Finance Corporation. And so what we're saying is that those tools are just as applicable here. The U.S. government has used them, some of them in the past, 
um, and that they are desperately needed because you cannot assume that you can revive the U.S. economy uh, solely through a large business. Um, you need this large, huge sector of the economy, which is reflected in the small businesses that are struggling so badly now, to be able to really help revive the economy in a profound way. It's not, this is not minor, the role the small businesses play. And, and one of the things that Agnes is referring to is the fact that what we've seen is that in our own country, diverse communities are some of the most efficient and effective job creators. So we're going to really need them. They're going to have to be financed. Uh, so because they will be critical to getting our economy back to where it should be. So Melissa, I'd love to bring you into this conversation. You have very much been the champion of small business and particularly as Arlen Hamilton of Backstage Capital describes the overlooked and underestimated entrepreneurs. I'm curious your vantage point on this idea of a U.S. development bank to the points that um, both Agnes and Dale mentioned, especially as we think about building intergenerational wealth. So it's not that there is access, which is one component um, and, and an incredibly important one, but it's how that wealth stays and builds inside of those communities. So would love your thoughts. No, I appreciate that. And, and I want to, again, thank you for the opportunity to be here and, and certainly commend uh, Agnes and Dale for bringing this forward. I think the recent COVID crisis, uh, coupled with the protests that were not just uh, about the death of George Floyd, but about the systemic inequities that certain communities experience, have really heightened this issue of are the markets, for example, or are institutions really working for everyone? And I think Agnes put it well, they're not working well for everyone. Um, I think that the, this idea of a development corporation uh, in the United States is a valid one for a couple of reasons. One, it is the opportunity uh, to bring new dollars to bear. Uh, we are in a highly competitive space, and the reality is that if you even look at the PPP program, such a small percentage went to small businesses. So just volume of dollars, I think there's been an adequate sizing of the capital needed for small businesses, particularly for women and people of color. The market has been sized by what they believe those entrepreneurs need versus what they actually need to survive without kind of firsthand knowledge. I think the second thing is distribution. Um, I saw someone ask about CDFIs. I think a couple of things, you know, this presence of this development corp is not anti anything that's in existence. I think it is helping to connect the dots between these disparate institutions that oftentimes do not support the, the trajectory of an entrepreneur. So if you think about how a business typically starts, there's angel financing friends and family. When I started my business and I asked my family for a couple thousand dollars, they were like, sure, you can have it, but I need it next week. And so the tolerance and the patient capital doesn't always exist, nor do we always have access to those social capital networks. And so this is an opportunity for a bank to kind of equalize that. I would also say we have to be mindful that the institutions we have are not adequately serving all entrepreneurs. If you think about even the PPP program, at first CDFIs were excluded. When they were then included, the reality is there was only one type of capital you could get, which was debt. And while you know some people can pay that off, there are businesses, particularly tech businesses, that have been subsidized for years. If you think about how Oracle started, how Dell started, they were subsidized by the government. Um, and so I think we have to recognize that there's different cash flow needs, and so we can't count on one type of institution. I think the person who asked the question is right. CDFIs have historically played a key role, particularly in communities of color and others who've been overlooked and underserved, but they have to know that there's one type of capital which may not fit all, and the pricing is also relatively high. CDFIs by nature do not tend to be profitable institutions like so many banks, and so you have to understand that oftentimes those rates are higher, and dare we not even begin to explore the fintech options that many entrepreneurs, particularly women, have taken advantage of because you can get a loan in 48 hours. The problem is you could be paying 25% plus. Um, so I think it's important that we look at this institution not just as a capital provider, but I would even say as a signal to the community of what is a viable business. And the final thing I would hope having, having served in Treasury under Clinton is that it also has a somewhat of a bully pulpit and that it leverages research and case studies and other stories to show what diverse types of capital can do across diverse communities. And, and I think finally I'll say, 
it's, it's an important step whether people believe in the actual structure or not. We think about 40 million people unemployed. Most of these corporations are not going to hire them back. We have to own that the small business sector is the primary driver of job creation in this community. And I would say with no disrespect to the SBA, we have not done a good job of supporting such a large segment of this community. If I could just follow on, because those are incredibly important points that Melissa just made. I mean, I do think that the way that we invest in U.S. in small businesses in the U.S. has changed. And the people who are really getting to those small businesses and providing them with the type of capital that they need are not traditional banks, which is what SBA traditionally works with. What it actually is, is CDFIs, so Community Development Finance Institutions, which are really community focused and have amazing relationships with local businesses. The second uh, is really these local funds that are really popping up everywhere. And I'll give a shout out to Melissa's fund, 1863, that is really trying to reach with appropriate capital, the types of entrepreneurs who are not necessarily going to be unicorns for VC capital to try to invest in. These are traditional businesses that are providing jobs, but are not going to grow to a $1 billion valuation. And the kind of capital that she's providing them with is not traditional equity or straight bank debt. She is doing revenue-based finance, where the repayment is actually linked to a percentage of the business's revenues. So that, uh, first of all, the entrepreneurs are not forced to give up control of their business, but also so that when they do well, they repay more and the investor does well. And when they do less well, they're not put out of business because they don't have to repay as much as they would with a traditional bank loan. So actually, uh, these new funds that are coming up with these very appropriate capital solutions all over the U.S. are really, really key to delivering capital, growth capital to entrepreneurs in the U.S. So that's kind of the second channel. And then the third channel that Melissa mentioned is the fintechs. So fintechs do vary. Some do charge exorbitant rates and there have to be guardrails put in if a government institution is going to work with these, but they are using data and AI to assess credit risk real time from sales data that they receive and other information. So they are able to deliver capital much more quickly than you would have to with a traditional bank. Um, and they're not asking for things like collateral, which most businesses, especially minority businesses, really cannot meet. So I think it's really, really key that those three channels are given a lot of, um, a lot of, a lot of assistance to really scale up because scale is what is needed. This is not a small problem. So if we really want to shore up our businesses, if we really want to help small businesses, especially minority businesses who've been creating, especially minority women who've created, I think, most jobs in the last decade, I think it's really, really key that we do this at scale. And that is why we are calling for a US uh, government agency so that we can really catalyze capital at scale, not just through individual programs that could be putting in money here and there, and, and also not on just a rescue basis, but much more on an ongoing long-term basis, because this will also take time. So can I just add that the issue of um, scale requires that in order to achieve scale, we have to find financing from a set of different kinds of investors. So it can't just be traditional banks although they are very important, obviously, but their capital has to come from other sources as well. And in order to get it, there has to be some knowledge and understanding of how, how to limit risks. And I think what's very interesting about the delivery mechanisms that Agnes just mentioned is that they, are, they each offer a different way to think about to really establish or limit risk. In other words, the, the fintech lenders have, as Agnes said, very accurate, real-time information, which in and of itself is very important. The investment funds about which she spoke and which Melissa runs uh, are usually embedded within specific communities and know those communities well. So they, have, they also have real-time knowledge. So I think that how the, the capital is delivered is of cr critical importance and making sure that those kinds of delivery mechanisms, which we now have some record and understand and performance record, that they are scaled up because otherwise we cannot achieve scale unless the underlying infrastructure exists to put the, put the capital to work. 
And I do want to say, you know, I, I'm really excited because I'm kind of also looking at the Q&A and folks have lots of ideas. I, I just want to highlight, I think what's important is, is also the institution itself. Um, you know, my sense is, is that we are seeing lots of plans or, or maybe not enough uh, of various acts and proposals and legislation that are designed to be able to support various communities. Uh, and I think those are going to be great. I don't see these as mutually exclusive. I think the challenge has been is that historically, and I could say even going back to Clinton and before, we have used a patchwork of legislation legislative measures to try to catch those that are following through a very broken system. And, and we can continue to do that. But I think as we look at the shift in a population to new majority, I think that to Agnes's point, we look at the majority of businesses being led by women, black women creating businesses six times their white male peers, that we have to have an institutional response. And so I put that out there because I'm aware of the criticisms of your bureaucracy and more of this and more of that. But, but I do think that if you use the international model, that pure institution, again, and capital, signal, legislation, bully pulpit, that's what we need. Otherwise, we're going to continue to have this ebb and flow because historically there have been times, uh, you know, post reconstruction where, uh, you know, black businesses were able to have access to capital because we ran our own banks. And so I do think it's important that we begin holistically, whether this issue or another issue, we move from these piecemeal uh, one off solutions, which are great in the short term, but really think about what are the systemic changes that need to be created to actually change change the barriers permanently and break them away as opposed to allowing us to leap over them moment by moment, which is really what we've seen with some of the existing programs. Can yeah, I, just, I, I would love to, oh, sorry, Dale. I was just going to say to Melissa's point, we always talk about exactly what you're talking about, where there are 45 different programs in the U.S. government, at least 45 programs that are focused on this kind of thing, but they're all disparate, they're fragmented. We, I think what we, the way we refer to it is lots of Christmas ornaments, but no tree. So I think we need the tree now. Exactly. So I, I want to build on that point. So as we think about the institution, um, we have to think about what are the set of uh, regulatory or like checks and balances in the system to think about equity. So, you know, of the delivery mechanisms that you talked about, for example, Agnes, one of them is FinTech. Um, I think there's oftentimes this, um, hopeful, uh, you know, optimism that AI will solve everything. But we also know that some of those technologies have bias included in them. And so that's just one example that figuring out where does this institution help provide some of the regulatory or checks and balances for equity? And then where is there the incentive side of it to think about scale and, and the way that you just mentioned. So I think just taking scale first, um, I do think that there's a need for actually all of these types of uh, uh, finance providers, they really all need additional capital. And the way to really do that is to potentially aggregate some opportunities that they are um, that they are funding. So, so taking a whole bunch of small business loans that maybe look similar and aggregating that into vehicles that then are maybe partially guaranteed by this corporation that can then be sold off to larger investors who need larger opportunities and who are really looking for ideas of how they can invest in the US, especially in the small business sector. So this institution can help aggregate opportunities to really reach scale and free up capital that way to those networks like CDFIs, like FinTechs and these funds so they have more capital to deploy to additional businesses. Um, on the impact side, I think impact measurement and monitoring is really key. And I think that uh, that's why you need legislation because it can actually call for reporting back to Congress of specific metrics. I think you can use guarantees or for example, technical assistance to target particular groups that have been underserved and incentivize that way more investors to be working with those underserved groups. Um, but I do think that monitoring and evaluation is really key. I think setting up uh, standards from the beginning of, for example, there are lots of FinTech funders who have, who have signed on to um, transparent lending principles, uh, which are actually sharing uh, with, their, uh, with, their, with the small businesses what kind of rates 
they are paying and are very, being very transparent about why uh, they are charging what they're charging. So I do think that there are groups that you can work with who are already trying to set standards. And I think this new institution can help, first of all, really set them so that investors know what they'll have to report against from the beginning, which I think all investors want. To, I mean, I don't think investors are against standards. I just think investors need to know what they'll be held accountable to from the beginning. And second, to really incentivize, um, like I said, reaching out to certain groups through the tools that it can deploy, like guarantees or grants to take first loss positions in certain vehicles that then target those underserved populations. So I think through the tools and through very good uh, setting up of standards and monitoring and evaluation afterwards, you can really set a path towards uh, really addressing some of the inequalities that have been happening. I'd love it if you could speak to, and that, that goes to anyone, um, the narrative change that I think I'm hearing embedded in this conversation around what an entrepreneur is defined as. And I think there's an archetype of the Silicon Valley type of entrepreneur that can be very detrimental in this conversation. And so, you know, we at the Beck Center really take a holistic view of impact and almost thinking about it like a movement. And the classic piece that is often missing is the narrative change. Um, and we're, we're seeing that, I think, come into fruition. Can you talk a little bit about how that has to go alongside the technical and delivery mechanism, all the things that we talked about? It's a really critical point you just made. Uh, that you don't need to have to, you don't need to be a company that could become a unicorn. Um, in order to be valuable to society. And a lot of the companies that were started that create jobs now, and, or have created jobs in the past, and I'll kind of go through some statistics for you that are really interesting later on. A lot of them uh, are not companies that are terribly exciting, but they're really important, particularly in the aggregate. So we have to realize the fact that venture capital, which unfortunately is mostly available on both coasts and not any place else, is very valuable and very important because it does create companies that will be high growth and can create innovation, et cetera. However, there are plenty of other companies that are equally valuable, equally important, and you need to find, we need to find a way to finance them that in, a way, in ways that are appropriate for those kinds of companies because those are often the companies that can create very fast job creation. So, and they're often very efficient. And their entrepreneurs in aggregate are high performers. So I would say that you've, you've, you've touched on maybe one of the most critical points in terms of reviving the economy. Just really two, two quick things to add on that. One is these entrepreneurs, especially minority entrepreneurs or women have been creating jobs without access to capital. Can you imagine what they could do if they really did have a lot of access to capital and the kind of resources that are needed? Um, I also think that it's important to say that the types of businesses that we're going to need post COVID are not necessarily the high growth tech firms, right? They're healthcare uh, providers. They are, uh, food systems companies. These are companies that will be needed to build resilience and to revive our economy. These are not the Silicon Valley type of companies that are really going to bring growth and jobs back to the U.S. Yeah, I, I would just say that, you know, to, to put it in, in, in kind of an archetype, you know, when we look at the entrepreneurs that I service, they are 90% you know, Black African American, 80% uh, women. Uh, majority of them are over 40. They have kids, they have families, uh, they've had corporate experience. Uh, many of them live in the South and the Midwest. Um, and so they're not in those places where there's robust investment vehicles for them. I would also say this is diversity, right? We, we have access to over 10,000 entrepreneurs. Some of them just want to help their community. They want to be a business that generates several hundred thousand dollars a year and it's an income replacement. Some of them want to build multi-million dollar businesses to employ and expand regionally. And then some, yeah, sure, maybe they want to become a unicorn. But I think 
understanding that it's a spectrum, that entrepreneurship is a continuum, not a data point, is where there's been a mismatch of capital. And I think we have to respect the type of business people want. I would also say that, you know, when you think about this whole Silicon Valley perspective, I think one of the greatest challenges um, that, that we all kind of struggle with is this reality that, you know, there's everybody's a tech business. But I had somebody that I work with run some statistics for me. And if you look at the total tech related businesses, um, of, of, or we'll just take black entrepreneurs, there's over 124,000 firms total, 122,000 are not in tech. And so the fact that the majority of capital that we tend to focus on is for such a small percentage of business, and that proportionality carries to all races and all genders, is just absolutely absurd. And I think to, to, to Agnes's point, as the economy recovers, right, this notion like what we were joking before the start, what does school even look like? I'm a professor at Georgetown. What does that look like? We have to recognize that COVID-19 is not just a health issue, but it's a community issue. It's an economic issue. It is upended how we operate. And so the naivete that we have that everybody who graduates is going to go into a tech job is just completely a, a false narrative. And so we do have to respect the diversity of people's choices and capital, but instead, the existing capital stacks either say, you're going to be a cash flow business and you're going to stay relatively local and I'm going to give you debt and you're going to pay a high price for it. Or you better be a really big business and I'm going to give you a ton of money and we're all going to pray that you're successful. But neither of those should be the only options. They should be a set of options. And I think that the current entrepreneurial trend has created created this North Star that is not realistic or desirous, and we have to be able to respect that. That's great. Um, I want to shift course a little bit, um, and I'd love to be a little more provocative. So, Melissa, um, in light of the murder of, of George Floyd and all of the heightened consciousness around the racial systemic injustice that, that you mentioned, how are you thinking um, private sector is, is kind of meeting this moment? So we've heard about Netflix making the $100 million effort to boost a black lenders, which you know, could nicely fit into a model like this. But what are some of the opportunities and frankly risks in like with this moment and this idea? Where do you think it's going? Yeah, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic on some days and cautiously pessimistic on others. I, I think to start with the challenges, I, I, I've had the privilege, I'm sure, with lots of other people to be on calls with these folks. And I do think they're driven by both fear and, and, and good intention. Um, I think the challenge is you cannot eradicate 401 years of systemic barriers with the writing of a single check. Um, and so I worry that just the pace of things is unrealistic and that the desired outcomes are not going to be possible because I can't fix what's been wrong for that long in six months so that you have a positive, impactful year-end report. So I think there's a naivete in terms of the cost uh, and the true burden and what it takes to overturn some of those systems as big as you know, racism within venture capital to something possibly less, less uh, rigorous, which is the implicit bias in a FICO score, in a credit score. Uh, and people are working on all of those, but we're not there yet. So my greatest concern is that there is an unrealistic expectation of what the Black community can do within the next six months to reverse 400 years of oppression. And, and that also is some ways insulting because it undermines the diversity that actually exists within our community. What is optimistic, though, particularly as time goes on, is that the, in, the investments have gotten bigger. Um, it was completely insulting when one very prominent venture capital firm came out with a $2.2 million fund for black and brown founders. Um, you know, we know that it costs, based on research I did at Georgetown, we know that it costs over a quarter of a million dollars for a black entrepreneur to start the same business as their white peer. So what's that kind of fun? Four businesses, maybe twice. Um, so I think this, this underestimation of our needs, but more importantly, an underestimation of our potential. I would also say, though, taking the Netflix example, having worked in Treasury and actually a regulator for black banks, what was amazing was the dollar amount. What a great signal effect of $100 million dollars. 
The problem was, and I know they were working on it for a while, the lack of understanding that there's not a single black bank, I don't think, that has that capitalization. And so the waivers that were required to be able to make those investments and then the ultimate extension to a CDFI of who I have tremendous respect of Bill Bynum at Hope. And so I think that part of my concern, but optimism is the desire for people to make a difference. But again, the short time frame that they think they can actually understand. Um, but I think I'll end on my great optimism is that all of these commitments and I actually there's a there's a Google sheet that's circulating amongst uh, some peers of mine there's about 74 commitments that have been made I think it's impressive that 74 people have stepped up um, whether or not they get fulfilled is a different story but I think the, the most optimistic thing is probably less about the capital and more about the conversation the fact that companies are having conversation of how I need to change the environment so people feel more comfortable and it's that's not the sole role of the head of diversity and inclusion the fact that capital providers are recognizing I'm going to stay in my VC lane, but I need to reach out to alternative financiers to be able to have that conversation and build a much more diverse pipeline. Um, so that's what I'm optimistic about is that whether or not the money actually makes it that the conversations will actually lead to systemic change, as opposed to I wrote a check, I deposited it, I'm done, uh, and you wait for the performance to be on the receiving party. That's unrealistic because we as the oppressed cannot change the systemic barriers by ourselves. So I have one final question um, for you before we turn it over to the Q&A. And as you can see, we have had a lot of really rich conversations. Um, so Agnes and Dale, as we, like one of the major reasons that we are putting on this Ideas That Transform is not just to put an idea out there, but for people to actually engage with it. So as, as you reflect on the idea, um, what do you see as opportunities for collaboration and for other people to get involved on, like with either the policy side or the implementation side or an adjacent avenue? So I think that, so I think that one of the things that's really, really important is to instill an urgency uh, in our legislators. So I do believe that all of us can uh, help really inform people who are making these decisions that there needs to be a systemic of change and not just relief packages. Relief packages are great, but they are just stepping stones towards something that will need to outlast those relief packages and will need to continue to help small businesses in our country on an ongoing basis. And the need for it is urgent. I mean, we've had a 22% uh, reduction in small business ownership. That's the largest on record. Um, so this is really, really an urgent, uh, an urgent need. And I think that the more we can tell our legislators that they need to be paying more attention to it, the better. Um, I do think the second thing is that this has to be a, uh, an institution that supports local solutions. So I think there's solutions that are, you know, state by state, community by community, all of uh, communities are not the same. They have different needs and there's a different context. So to really understand in your local community, who are the people that are trying to change uh, the way capital is delivered and how are they making those connections with legislators and with investors would be really, really important to explore and to share because I do think there are lots of amazing solutions that really never see the light of day because they happen to be in Alabama. And people in DC might have never heard of a great way to support uh, small entrepreneurs, minority entrepreneurs. So really bringing to light a lot of these, this innovation that's happening uh, through social media, through publishing on these, uh, on these efforts is really, really key. I think that there's also an opportunity to change a major narrative here that everyone can participate in, which is that, you know, we, we talk about capital not being accessible in, for, to, to diverse communities, which is absolutely true. But the critical issue that we've really uncovered is that in the last decade, minority entrepreneurs created 4.7 million jobs. Now compare that to the job, number of jobs we've lost. We've lost, it depends upon the moment or the day, but somewhere in the range of 18, initially 18 million jobs. So 4.7 million jobs, being able to create that is really significant. 
uh, that this community could do it. And as Agnes said, uh, almost 2,000 new women-owned businesses were launched every day in 2018. This is a very um, a productive group of people. And women of color founded 64% of these businesses. And if you look between 2007 and 2012, which was a while ago, nonetheless, the number of employees of minority-owned firms increased by 23% while non-minority owned firms employment fell by 4%. So this is a moment when we really need this community to do something significant for this country and, we, and they are quite capable of doing so, we believe, if they have capital. So I think we need, we need to change the narrative about that, about their potential, that they are economically critical to this country, not just for their own communities, but for the country as a whole. So I want to turn it over to our audience and I will invite my colleague and fair finance portfolio lead, Andrea McGrath, who's been monitoring the questions to help us do a quick lightning round of audience Q&A. And just a quick plug um, for our next event that is actually talking about shifting power from funders to communities, um, which picks up some of the threads that, you know, Agnes, you just mentioned. That will be in August. So we look forward to engaging in a follow on conversation here. Over to you, Andrea. Thank you, Nate. Uh, thanks to our audience as well, I've been submitting some really interesting questions. Um, they've really ranged from some specifics to much broader. Um, we've had about a little over 10 minutes to explore a number of them, so I want to jump right in. Um, to the panelists, I just want to let you know we've kind of grouped some themes together, and while you're all Welcome to join in common. I'm going to be trying to move us through at a good pace so we can get to as many as, as we can. So let me start off, as you can imagine, a few questions came in that were really on, on the bank idea itself, some structure or operational questions. So let me ask Agnes, let me start with you. If this, was, if this idea was going to kick off, what kind of legislation would be needed to launch it? And what level of capitalization are you envisioning for it? And where would it sit? Right. So a few questions together. So I, you know, I also think that's an open question, but I have some ideas. I mean, that's something that's best decided by legislators and really uh, those on the Hill who work with various agencies, because as we mentioned, there are lots of programs across different agencies, USDA, Commerce, SBA, obviously, but also some, you know, Department of Transportation. There are lots of small business support programs that we need to take into account and really try to figure out how to coordinate better across them or, so should some of those be moved? Um, but I do think that there are some uh, ideas of either reforming the SBA itself or potentially uh, the US Development Finance Corporation now does have a remit uh, to, to do some work in the US uh, that's related to the COVID response. So I do think that they do have the tools like guarantees and um, equity authority that are already in place. So I don't know if there would be new authorities needed. I think that it would be good for legislators to take a look at what exists and really figure out where would this be best positioned? Because in addition to the tools, this agency does need to have a presence in the US. So this is not something that you can build probably from scratch where you really need at least every state to have a representative of some sort of uh, boots on the ground to really understand what's happening in that state. I do think that that's important. Um, so I, I don't have you know, very set ideas on where it should sit, but I do think there's plenty of opportunity to actually take existing programs and make them more efficient. Um, and by actually coordinating them or moving them to an entity that may already exist. I think that that's, that's probably the answer to that. It probably would be good if it went to an agency that had a development mission. Right. That's really different from what we have now, other than internationally. So having a development mission then leads into being able to assess impact. So the, I would, we, would, we would probably say that that's how, how, how this should be thought of. Um, so a few questions we've had around participation, some of them with geographic focus and some more sector based. So I know you've spoken to a little bit, but we definitely some questions about how you envision the private sector engaging or supporting. So 
is this related to uh, to the geographic disparity? Sorry, this is um, that's the second. This is really related to just private sector in general. It can speak to both, yeah. and then we definitely have geographic or local questions. So I see Melissa nodding. So maybe I'll let her jump in here. Well, well I, um, I guess there's three things that come to mind quickly. I think one is the Netflix example, right? That that companies um, are are not. Um, stuck within what they can and cannot do. They probably have the broadest set of, of opportunity to really engage in issues that are both financially and socially oriented. So I think just thinking literally about where your deposits are uh, is one, what is your supply chain relationship? You know, who are, what is your supplier development policy? How are you procuring items, whether it is to support your local community or to engage more women or communities of color? So I think that's one. Um, I think the second thing is, you know, relationships and partnerships. Uh, you know, many entrepreneurs, particularly women and entrepreneurs of color who, or, or even more traditional entrepreneurs, but who don't want to go the venture capital route, but have this desire to grow, thinking about the use of strategic partnerships, not just from a hierarchical procurement level, but from a product or service development and bringing something to market level of sharing backend resources or R&D, but, but both sides leveraging both intellectual property, human capital resources is, is another viable option. And the final thing, you know, I know that there are some corporations who choose not to be engaged in policy, but I'm going to use small p and policy, not politics. I do think that there are ways for corporations to get involved, right? We had the fact that citizens are considered people now, uh, we had that act many years ago, that they should use that and engage and, and think about, you know, what are policies, practices, or procedures that are useful, not just for themselves, but the communities they serve. You know, back in the day, while it was often a contentious relationship, many manufacturing plants had to give in order to receive in terms of what were some of the policies and procurement and hiring practices. Think about that, not just where you have a plant, but think about how can you do that on a national level. So I think there's lots of ways that, that private companies can be involved as opposed to absolving themselves and saying that's a political issue. I think I'm also on the investor side, I think, you know, one of the key things that investors can do is start looking at some of these funds that may be smaller, they may be actually uh, managed by first time fund managers, but they are delivering the type of capital that is really needed by these entrepreneurs. So 1863 is one of them. Collab in Atlanta is a great one. Um, the initiative that I lead at Coffin Foundation is trying to support several with uh, first LP capital that is really difficult for them to raise. Um, so I think looking at these funds and figuring out um, how to invest in them, because they're not deploying straight debt and straight equity, which maybe investors are used to, really giving, and they're not managed by, by experienced fund managers, but they really understand their communities. And they are the ones that are delivering the capital that's going to build those businesses. So I think investors stretching a little bit and thinking about may, this may not look exactly like all the funds that I've always invested into, but actually, they really understand the entrepreneurs in their community, and they seem to be delivering the type of capital that the entrepreneurs could pay back. It's a great investment opportunity. So I do think that um, expanding, investors expanding their horizons a little bit and thinking beyond the box of how to place money with these managers would, be, would go a very long way. Agnes, that's great. I think you just touched on what would have been in the part B, which is that there was a few questions in thinking about how this bank would uh, support at the local level and work at the local level, with a, which I think you just spoke to well on kind of speaking to the smaller funds. Um, one, I just wanted to be sure to insert it because a few people asked about how you're thinking about access specifically to rural areas and to know if e either of you want to address that. Sure. I mean, it's going back to the community by community and state by state approach, right? right? Because rural approaches may be different. Um, and I do think that there are you know, examples of how the US government has done this in the past. The SSBCI program, for example, uh, that was enacted as a response to the 2008 recession, uh, very successfully provided capital to states to then provide capital to those who are funding small businesses, whether through debt so they work with lots of local CDFIs or through equity, they work with a lot of local funds and they managed for each dollar um, provided by the government to catalyze $8 of private financing. So there's actually a track record of how you can do this if you are supporting local solutions. So I believe for rural areas, this would apply. And it did apply during the SSBCI program. So that was right across the country in 50 different states and you can actually go on the website 
and see, although it's difficult to, ma to maneuver on it, but you can actually see what happened in each state. So it had nothing to do with, it was equally effective whether it was in a rural area and urban area. And it's a good model for, um, for how this could be done via the states. Andrew, just while you raise that, I would put this back to the audience that I, that I think, you know, one of the, the larger framework that Agnes teed up early on is historically overlooked and underserved as a great frame because that's rural America, that's native nations and lands um, that I think, again, have been, uh, for lack of a better word, ghettoized in certain federal agencies, but there has been a lack of integration recognizing that a business institution should look across the board, respect the diverse capital needed. Um, so I think that that's also something I would put back to folks who are watching to be thoughtful around policies and taking in the nuances that we are not all a homogenous group, and I'm in D.C., and it's not the same as New York, and it sure as heck isn't the same in Alabama, uh, but also definitely very different on a Navajo Nation and how do we begin to think about policy that's not just for the mainstream, but for everybody who's actually engaged in this. Because let's be clear, entrepreneurship is even more vital to those communities who are not just overlooked and underserved, but literally and physically disconnected uh, from main arteries of commerce. This is their primary driver of, of economic capacity. Yeah. Great, thank you. So let me be sure we've got a few on the broader lens and let me be sure to ask one directly why our time's running tight. So national investment banks elsewhere combine business lending with real asset investment and strategic direction of industrial policy. Why shouldn't these be integrated rather than having a separate small business entity? Agnes, I might start off with you with this one. So I do think that as we spoke about, small businesses need particular types of assistance, right? And they're not just about um, the kind of support that larger companies need, right? I mean, they do need a lot of technical assistance, so capacity building. Uh, they do need a lot of uh, access to equity, right? Not just debt. Um, so I do think that it's a bit of a different approach. And because there's such an amazing, powerful engine, 99% of U.S. businesses are small businesses, right? This is why we believe that this really needs a very targeted um, agency that will actually have a relentless focus on doing this and not think about overall industrial policy. However, we do think that post-COVID, there needs to be a lot of attention paid to which sector small businesses should be restarting in and how they can be not only creating jobs, but also helping economic growth in the sectors where we're going to need it most, where we're going to need it most, or we're going to build resilience. So I do think that it's, it's a different approach than what you would need when working with large corporations. Great. Any other thoughts or one question I want to sneak in before I have to turn it um, over to Nate. Um, there's definitely been a group of questions around how a U.S. development bank could support community investments beyond small business. So thinking about real investments in real estate or broadband or infrastructure. Um, Melissa, I might start with you and get your response to that. Um, <laughs> I have mixed reviews and so I don't want to undermine the idea because I think it's a good one. You know, I think in the international model, when we've moved beyond capital, it's been somewhat challenging. I want to say I think there is a role, but I cannot reinforce what Agnes said enough is that at some point in time, you also have to let the communities leave. I think there have been amazing examples of international institutions engaging, uh, but there's been other times where they have overlooked the capacity and decision making of local communities. So I think from a capital perspective, absolutely. From a policy perspective, absolutely. But from final decision making, that really needs to be driven on a local level because everyone needs are going to be different. Uh, we certainly have seen policy related efforts to kind of distribute things equally, but we have to recognize not all communities are equal. Uh, so I think that becomes more of a, a decision making question, but I'll, I'll leave that to Agnes and Dale to, to flesh out. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I completely agree. I, I do think that um, the community by community and state by state approach is really key, right? And because it's when I'm, I traveled a lot through the US um, in the last two years when developing this idea. And frankly, it depends, you know, Ohio might have, uh, Cincinnati is going to have different needs than rural Ohio, right? So you really need to think about what is applicable and that's best done at the community level. Communities know what they need. They often don't know where to go to get it, 
because there's so many programs that it's impossible for them to figure out where to go. But they really, really do know what the answer should be on growing their own, on, on increasing equity, on economic growth in their neighborhoods. They have very good ideas. Uh, so I think providing a connection between those ideas, first of all, creating a network of people that can really share those ideas among each other, and also providing uh, a link in to the government and how the government could support those ideas is really, really key. Great. Thank you all. This has been really interesting. Many more questions uh, we can't get to, but I want to thank everyone for their um, for sending them. And clearly the conversation is still continue. So Nate, I'm going to turn it back to you to close us out. And thank you again to the panelists. Thanks, Andrea. Um, so before everyone jumps off, I know that we uh, want to do a quick lightning round um, with one more question for our panelists. Um, again, the intent of this whole series is to spark new ideas, um, collaborations. So I'd love for each of you to close with one action that you'll take or that you would encourage others to take as a result of this idea or some of the conversation that we had. Um, I would also encourage participants to use hashtag Beck Ideas on Twitter. We'd love to hear some of the actions that you take as well, um, but Melissa, do you mind kicking us off? Sure, so, so I have one that, that I have done and will continue to do, and I would say one to the group based on the questions. Um, my commitment is to continue to do research. Um, you know, I do think that there has not been a, there is not a uh, depth of research around the impact of women and entrepreneurs of color, uh, in part because we don't track data that way for a variety of reasons. Even PitchBook, for example, does not track race, and they just started to track gender. So I do think having the data to drive decisions is extremely important, so I'm committed to continue to do that. Uh, what I would encourage to the group, I, let me just say I want to thank everybody who joined because the flurry of activity in the Q&A was amazing. Um, and I would say get involved. Uh, you know, we are entering a big people <laughs> cycle uh, and some folks have some really good ideas some folks were pulling legislation from people's plans already um, but I think no one's gonna get them across the finish line unless you keep doing what you're doing which is popping up on webinars and sharing them and then getting actively engaged uh, because we are gonna hit regardless of what party you're in we're gonna hit a precipice on local state and federal level where potentially new leadership or change leadership will come and this is the chance to be able to insert your views so keep doing what they're doing yeah, what, what I'm really committed to is continuing to the drumbeat on the importance of small businesses in the US and on the urgency to support them. So I do think that that's something that I'm very much committed to and hope that others uh, can really help carry that drumbeat further. What we're doing specifically is we're, we are briefing um, numerous Senate offices on the specifics of this so that they can potentially carry this forward. That's how we were engaged before for the BUILD Act. And so we would really welcome others who can speak out, can speak to their um, representatives and, and any conversation that people want to have on the subject in support of the subject. Because, you know, if you just look at the numbers, uh, the capital that would be needed over a one year period to replace the jobs that we've lost is somewhere in the range of about $140 billion. Obviously, I mean, I guess government, U.S. government could provide that, but it's un unlikely to do so. That capital could be a fifth from the U.S. government and the rest from the private sector. So getting that point across, that leverage, or, um, meaning getting more capital from the private sector, and that there's a way to do that uh, is, I think, really important so that the Congress understands this is not just all about rescue measures. It's about long-term solutions that can get the economy back on its, on its feet. Well, I know we are at the top of the hour. Thank you so much for this rich dialogue. Um, it was such a pleasure. And thank you to our audience that made for such an interactive conversation. A few quick things. We will have a follow-up note that we will send out with some high-level takeaways, uh, including a recording of this conversation and specifically ways to engage. Uh, we also have an upcoming Ideas That Transform event, Shifting Power from Investors to Communities. That will be Tuesday, August 18th at 12 p.m. So please be sure to RSVP there. Um, but 
please join me in thanking our amazing panelists for this rich conversation. And thank you all for joining.